the do not. Oh, sorry. I've set it to record to my computer, so I'll pop it on a Dropbox link at some point. I'll edit this beginning bit out. Um, no, leave it in. <laughs> um, fab. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the entire afternoon to chat to me, Joe. I'll have just done the presentation right now. And again, for everybody who is experiencing this from the conference, we are recording this in your past because, again, I can't be there because I will be in tech when you are watching or listening to this. And I will see you in real time very soon. Yeah. But yeah, we're doing some real temporal time shifts here. Very Doctor Who, channeling our inner Doctor Who right now. Um, so Joe and I are just going to have a chat about the process of um, building and experiencing and, you know, kind of living with the unlimited board and what that means. And we thought the first thing to kick off is that, I, Joe, I'd love to get your thoughts on, or just a bit of an overview about what is our board, who is it, comp who is it compromised of, um, and kind of like the disability status of our board, I guess. Okay, so uh, Joe Verrant, if you don't know, I'm senior producer at Unlimited. We're transitioning from a programme into an independent organisation and we set up our board or our board in waiting a year ahead of that transition so that we really had, that's the dog. If you hear anything, see anything, it's the dog, cone, head, knackers off. It's all one of those things going on at the moment. So we set up our board a year ahead of the uh, time that we needed it to happen so that the board really had a chance to bed in. Uh, we recruited a large board. We've got a board of 13 and we still aim to get bigger. We're gonna be, uh, have, we've got, just got a new treasurer joining us soon. And uh, we'll have one other board member uh, joining us once we're more firmly established. And we wanted a big board deliberately because we knew we wouldn't always, uh, not everybody would be able to attend every meeting. Because it's really important for us as a disability led organization that the board was disability led. And we started off with the old, you know, it's got to be at least 51% type thing. But actually, everyone on our board, bar one person, is a disabled person. Now, they might not all use that terminology. Sorry, the dog is attacking me. Uh, they might not all use that terminology. Some people define themselves as uh, people with long-term health conditions. Some people define themselves as people with access requirements. There's a real mixed variety. And that's OK with us because... At Unlimited, we really take people where they are, um, don't insist that everybody thinks the same. We really like that diversity. So I think at the moment we're 92% disabled, which somebody told me would never happen because there weren't enough disabled people out there to be on boards to get to that kind of number, which is just total bollocks. I was just saying we've just appointed our treasurer, a disabled person. So the people are out there, you've just got to attract them yeah absolutely I mean like, I know so many disabled people who are really keen to be on board but actually they just haven't found you know the right culture fit or they feel very cautious about entering predominantly non-disabled spaces where they know that they're going to be like the person that does access and things like that and so it can often be a very kind of unsavory proposition I think for a lot of disabled people and I, I really love being part of the board um I've had a really great time I mean what you just touched on is about how we found people and you know I experienced that recruitment process from one side of things and it was the first time I had considered being on a board I was really interested in what that structure meant I didn't really know a lot about governance um I was doing the fun arts fundraising and philanthropy fellowship so I was really interested, you know, everybody talks about the relationship between governance and fundraising. And so I really wanted to get to know what that meant a lot more. And so when the Alpha Unlimited came up, I'd already engaged with Unlimited as an artist. And so I was like, you know what, I know this organisation. I feel like I really want to be part of it. And actually, you know, I had a lovely chat. And I think the process for me was that I'd written an application and mine was in the form of a PowerPoint presentation because that's how I prefer to do things. And I've done quite an extensive PowerPoint with a lot of photos of myself from what I remember for some reason. Um, and then I had a lovely chat um, with part, uh, members of what I think was called like the advisory council, the transition group of people that were kind of looking after tr the transition. Um, and for me, it was like phenomenal to be in a very like affirming process where 
you know, your access needs were really catered for at all times. How was that recruitment process for you? What were, you know, what were you really conscious of? What were your priorities in that, in that recruitment? We really wanted to reach uh, a very wide range of people and a very different range of people. We didn't want to just have people who'd been on boards before. Um, we took advice about the best way of really diversifying the people who might come to us. And it was very much that it was like, let people apply how they want to, and then have a chat, not an interview. So we got a subcommittee of our advisory group together to lead us through that process. We, had, we were inundated. Uh, with uh, responses we shortlisted down and then we had conversations with people about why they were interested and what they might offer and what they might you know be able to you know, exchange a reciprocal arrangement and then from that we just got narrower and narrower uh, down to you know down to our, our fab 13 but the I was quite nervous at first about the idea of just let everybody apply in the way they want I didn't know how we would um score fairly you know I was yeah I'm, I'm old I'm quite welded sometimes to quite traditional processes that's what I was brought up with oh you have to do it this way so it was quite a departure to do it differently uh, but I would absolutely always do it that way from now on the so many people said they felt welcomed by the process they felt it was somewhere they would fit in. They felt automatically on reading the information that was available uh, on video, as well as in a whole load of other formats. People said, I want to be part of this. People bought in right from that moment. So the selection was really tough because there were a lot of people we had to say no to that we're still in contact with because we can't quite bear to let them go. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I talk to people about what's it mean to be on a board? And the first thing anybody talks to you about is like the financial responsibility and making sure the organization keeps going. And, you know, I've never run an organization, had never run an organization from, from senior leadership level at the time. So I was very like, oh God, what's, what's it going to be like? Am I going to have to wear a suit all the time? Like, I don't know if that's going to be my kind of thing. And so, you've got pants on. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, because all our meetings are on Zoom, it doesn't even matter about the pants either. So, um, on that finance thing, we made a very conscious decision to be quite explicit that being on our board was not about giving us money. You know, we really wanted to work against that again quite a traditional notion of a board that it just discriminates against such a huge range of people uh, who don't have that financial wherewithal and are you saying that those people aren't vital and valid and their opinion doesn't matter you know I think that really sucks I think everybody contributes towards fundraising and strategies and thinking but not everybody's got hard, cold hard cash and that's perfectly fine for us yeah, I mean, I think in any kind of diverse board recruitment, you have to realise that anybody with an experience in marginalisation, it normally will also affect their socioeconomics because it affects your ability to access things like professional class space and stable incomes and all those kind of things. So like any kind of diverse recruitment, oh my God, sorry, my screen just changed very suddenly. Um, any kind of like diverse board recruitment has to recognise the socioeconomics of the people um, that are likely to be affected by these structures that we're trying to almost defy a lot of the time. Absolutely. Um, and I said our, our board was predominantly disabled people. Sorry, dog now has a cup. Um, but it's also incredibly intersectional, uh, you know, uh, from people with lived experience of homelessness, people in the global majority, uh, people on the LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQIA plus uh, spectrum. There's, there's the intersections were looked for but have exceeded even what we would have hoped for and it's those intersections that bring us so many benefits there are there is so much that our board knows that I don't know that, you know even though I think I know a lot they just know masses about a whole range of things that I've got no idea of and they bring those to every single meeting every single opportunity to contribute so now that you've assembled your fab 13 which is something I'm I think we should introduce to our, new, to our board meetings. How have you found it? What has it been like to have a board? What have been the positives of this whole process and structure for you? Well, again, I was quite nervous because I've run Unlimited or, you know, Unlimited has run as a programme and I've been leading that programme for eight years. So we haven't had governance in this way before. So I was slightly nervous about what it would be like. Um, 
but it's brilliant. I feel supported. I feel people, I had a, a health issue recently and people were able to step in and take things off my shoulders when I was in hospital in a way that I'd never, I'd never been able to relax into my own health issues before. It had always still been quite an ableist struggle in myself to keep performing at, uh, at this normative optimum. And to actually go, do you know what, Joe? You're a bit ill at the moment. You know, just step back. I can remember uh, you know, emailing you at some point, having a panic attack at the moment, just about to go under anaesthetic. Could you deal with this? <laughs> and, you know, you just took it on. And to be able to do that, uh, to authentically be able to just be me, in that moment was something that I haven't experienced before. And I think there's something about the little cryptum that we've created that means I can say that without knowing 100% that you will not judge me negatively mm -hmm. for that. You just kind of go, oh yeah, that's fair enough. Right, I'll do that then. Yeah, I think it's so innate in all of our instincts that there are going to be absences because part of disability is like absence from normativity sometimes because, you know, a lot of the time we can't, work and do labor and it's what I said in my presentation that while we value people in terms of their labor uh, predominantly you know it will always be an ableist system because we don't work in the same way for a lot of the time um and I think that's true you know like I've you know been overwhelmed sometimes and disappeared for a bit and other people have on the board and you know sometimes you've emailed us and gone what about this and we've gone have you considered that we've got this big piece of work to do in that time frame and maybe we shouldn't do that then um and it's been quite yeah, nice that's the other brilliant thing about the board for me is that uh that they're empowered to stop me which is great and that's something I was really open with with the board kind of going you know I don't know my own limits sometimes I don't know the organization's limits you know I have an insatiable ambition because the world needs changing and you know we're part of making that change happen. So it's not from an egotistical point of view, but it is from a um, but but it impacts on capacity. You know we cannot do everything that comes our way, however much it would help us change the world. We we have finite capacity, and the board can act as a real buffer around that. And because they have lived experience of a whole range of different things, they really get capacity. They really understand that from a grassroots level. It's not a kind of a notional thing. It's an absolutely lived thing. People really, really understand that. And that's priceless. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things about lived experience on the board as well is the fact that we don't have sort of a nominated person whose responsibility it, whose responsibility it is to do the access or to do the disability or to do those kind of things. Actually, because we have such a intersectional board with a lot of experiences we can all contribute but it also means that we can all contribute to things that aren't specifically focused on access and things like that so like we can contribute to the same no and we can contribute to strategies and communications and those kind of things yes, we don't spend every board meeting on access yeah i mean exactly <laughs> we really don't. that's just that's just there we, we we have it in place every meeting is captioned you know and there's a cost implication to those things we probably spend more on boards you know, uh, everybody who needs it has a meal voucher, you know, a meal, you know, can claim back a meal on the week of a board meeting so that they're not put out, you know, by that time there's expenses. It costs more, but um, yeah, what we get, I've just noticed the time. We are over 10 minutes. Okay. Our board is brilliant. The Fab 13, <laughs> go for it. We're having a great time. Thank you so much for chatting. Um, and I believe everybody's going to see you again shortly to have a bit of a Q&A.